A solar eclipse occurs when the Sun, Moon, and Earth are aligned in such a way that the Moon fully or partially blocks sunlight, causing a portion of the Earth to be engulfed in a shadow. In a total eclipse, the disk of the Sun is fully obscured by the Moon, whereas in partial eclipses only part of the Sun is obscured. Total solar eclipses are rare events, occurring somewhere on Earth every 18 months on average. Total eclipses are rare because the timing needs to be exact for an alignment between the observer on Earth and the centers of the Sun and Moon, and because the elliptical orbit of the Moon often takes it far enough away from Earth that its apparent size is not large enough to block the Sun entirely. While a partial solar eclipse will be visible over a surrounding region thousands of kilometers wide, the area of totality only occurs in a narrow path across Earth's surface. And in the cosmological sense, solar eclipses are even more rare. As a 2015 World Economic Forum article notes, the fact that we see a solar eclipse at all is something of a miracle. While six of the eight planets in our solar system have moons, Uranus has a whopping 27 moons that we know of, ours is the only planet in the solar system where a total solar eclipse could be seen from the planet's surface. That is because we are the only planet so far discovered whose moon appears from the surface to have the same angular size in the sky as that of the sun. It is 400 times smaller, but also 400 times closer. It is this cosmological coincidence that allows the moon to completely block out the sun. As the moon is slowly growing more distant from Earth, eventually total solar eclipses will no longer appear here on Earth. Aside from the awe they inspire, total eclipses are a scientific bonanza, offering a unique ability to study otherwise hidden phenomena. For example, eclipses offer a rare opportunity to study the sun's inner corona, which is usually obscured by brightness which provides a better understanding of things like solar storms and the solar wind. A solar eclipse in 1919 allowed scientists to observe stars with an apparent position near the Sun. This allowed British astronomer Arthur Eddington to test and validate a component of Albert Einstein's theory of general relativity. But scientific study during a solar eclipse is challenging, not just because of their rarity, but also their brevity. Total solar eclipses only last a few moments as the Moon circles the planet. The duration of an eclipse depends upon multiple factors, whether the moon is at perigee, the time when it appears largest, whether the moon appears directly overhead, something called the subsolar point, the distance the Earth is to the sun in its elliptical orbit, whether the vector of the eclipse path is following the Earth's rotation or angular to it, and how close the path is to the equator where the Earth's rotational velocity is fastest, thus keeping up with the moon longer. Given these factors, a total solar eclipse may occur for only a few seconds in a given spot and can only, if all factors align, last a total of a few minutes. In fact, the longest duration possible for a total solar eclipse on Earth is only around seven and a half minutes. And that's not a lot of time for study. But there is a cheat. The duration is brief because the Moon and Earth are moving. The Moon's shadow, or umbra, moves across the Earth's surface at some 1,700 kilometers per hour. But if you were to get into an airplane and follow the shadow, you could extend the length of time that you can view an eclipse. But it has to be a very fast plane. At 30,000 feet, 1,700 kilometers per hour is more than one and a half times the speed of sound. And thus, the solar eclipse of June 30th, 1973 offered an unprecedented scientific opportunity. Not only was the point of greatest eclipse over the Sahara Desert in the West African nation of Niger of exceptionally long duration, in excess of seven minutes, but for the first time in history, there was the realistic possibility for scientists to study the eclipse from a supersonic plane. The airframe that would eventually be called the Concorde started as different programs to develop a supersonic transport, or SST, in France and the United Kingdom. In November of 1962, the two nations joined their projects, and the project became a joint development of the French state-owned Sud Aviation and the British Aircraft Corporation. The combined effort initially put the project ahead of similar efforts in the Soviet Union and the United States. The name Concord means agreement or harmony. While economic estimates suggested the project would never be profitable, the thinking at the time was that the future of passenger airline designs was going to be supersonic and development was an imperative to protect the future of aircraft manufacturing in the two countries. First flown in March of 1969, the Concorde offered the possibility of a supersonic plane large enough to carry scientists and experiments and fast enough to chase the moon's umbra as it raced across North Africa, west to east. At 202 feet long, the Concorde could be configured to carry up to 120 passengers and was capable of a cruising speed of more than 2100 kilometers per hour. By contrast, standard jet airliners have cruising speeds usually between 800 and 900 kilometers per hour. By following the path of the eclipse, the Concorde could extend the observation time from seven minutes 
tenfold to more than 70 minutes, allowing an unprecedented opportunity for science. And, of course, observing from a plane would allow the scientists to conduct their experiments above the clouds, avoiding the possibility that their opportunity to observe the eclipse would be obscured by weather. But in 1973, the Concorde was still in its testing phase, and only four airframes had been produced, one each of a prototype and a pre-production prototype made in France in the United Kingdom. The challenge for scientists was whether they could get Britain or France to let them borrow one of their prototypes to chase the June solar eclipse. The first request was made to the British, but the British test program was behind schedule, and the idea was rebuffed. But in May 1972, French astronomer Pierre Lennet took his case to André Turcotte, the chief test pilot for what was by then called Aerospatiale, which had merged several organizations, including Sud Aviation, in 1970. Turcotte, best known as the initial pilot for the Concorde, was impressed with the plan and essentially sold the idea to Aerospatiale, who tentatively agreed to fund the project, which would be flown on the first prototype. Serial number 001. In 2016, Lynn accommodated that he thinks he would not have been so able to make his case successfully today when organizations are more formal and hierarchical. The plane had to be modified. As the eclipse is going to be directly above the plane, four portals had to be cut in the roof, which would both have to withstand the pressure differential between the cabin and outside, but also the extreme temperatures on the outside of the plane that were the result of friction at such high speeds. The temperatures of the skin of the Concorde could exceed 100 degrees Celsius, or 212 degrees Fahrenheit. Turcotte was in charge of planning the route. Runways would have to be chosen that were able to accommodate the plane and fit the flight path, and permission would be required from the countries overflown. Mauritania agreed to close its airspace to commercial flights during the test. The decision was to have the plane take off from Gran Canaria in the Canary Islands and land at N'Djamena, the capital of the Republic of Chad. In all, five scientific teams were created, representing the French Institute of Astrophysics, Kitt Peak National Observatory, Los Alamos National Laboratory, Queen Mary University of London, and the University of Aberdeen. Each team had different scientific objectives, and using five teams maximized the opportunity for research and spread out the risk if an experiment failed. The teams would have to produce appropriate equipment in a relatively short time frame. The equipment would have to be able to withstand the heavy vibration of the SST's takeoff and could not have anything that could short out or cause a fire. Taking off from Gran Canaria, the plane demonstrated one of the great limitations of supersonic flight. A wing maximized for flight faster than the speed of sound did not produce much lift at lower speeds. While the slender delta wing created vortices above the wing that produced additional lift, it still took a significant amount of thrust to get a Concorde airborne. Merely taxiing and taking off, burned as much fuel as it would take to fly a Boeing 737 from London to Amsterdam. The timing and navigation went flawlessly, and Concorde 001 intersected with the eclipse at 56,000 feet. Flying along in sync with the Umbra, the plane used its nighttime navigational lights. The scientists were able to study the eclipse for a record 74 minutes. While all five experiments were successful and, as Lena said, contributed to the normal progression of scientific knowledge, none of them actually revolutionized our understanding of the sun's corona. In addition to the experiments aboard the Concorde, thousands of scientists studied the exceptionally long 1973 total solar eclipse from the Earth's surface at a path of total eclipse that traveled all the way from Guyana to the Seychelles Islands, although in some places observation of the eclipse was obscured by the weather. The Concord was never again used for the scientific study of solar eclipses, and the fleet was finally retired in 2003. Today, solar eclipses are largely studied by satellites, which can create artificial eclipses. The very first prototype of the Concord, airframe 001, was retired in October of 1973, having flown some 812 hours testing the airplane's systems. It is currently on display, still in the livery used for the June 1973 flight at the Museum of Air and Space in Le Bourget, France. If you enjoyed this History Guy short, then feel free to click that like button, subscribe to our channel, and check us out on Patreon, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and our merchandise on teespring.com.